my name is Kat Larson. I am the chapter president of Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society here at Madison College. On behalf of Phi Theta Kappa, Student Senate, and Women Lead, I would like to thank you all for coming today. I would I'd also like to take a moment to thank these wonderful student organizations for the hard work and dedication you have put into this topic and this event. It all began with the idea of Phi Theta Kappa creating a service event in honor of Women's History Month. The idea turned into a much deeper conversation, and those conversations turned into research. Currently, we are looking at how to help alleviate the cost, so, social stigmas, and other issues surrounding menstrual products for students at Madison College. Today, I have the honor of introducing Wisconsin State Representative Melissa Sargent, whose work we both uh, respect and admire. Her mission to eliminate the pink tax with the state of Wisconsin aligns with our current interest. Of course, her work also began with small steps. Representative Melissa Sargent was born and raised in Madison, Wisconsin, and is a proud graduate of East High School and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Representative Sargent was first elected in November 2012 and is currently serving in her third term in the Wisconsin State Legislation. She represents the 48th Assembly District, which encompasses the east and north sides of the city of Madison and the village of Maple Bluff. Representative Sargent is a strong, progressive voice in the Wisconsin State Legislature. During her tenure, Representative Sargent has fought for legislation raising Wisconsin minimum wage, providing equitable access to menstrual hygiene products, legalizing marijuana, empowering survivors of sexual assault, protecting privacy rights, among many other important issues. For the 2017-2018 legis legislative session, Representative Sargent serves on the Joint Legis Legislative Aud Audit Committee, the Joint Committee on Information Policy and Technology, the Assembly Committees on Ways and Means, Energy and U Utilities, Mental Health, and Small Business Development, and the Assembly Ways and Means Subcommittee on Personal and Corporate Income Taxes. Prior to her election to the state legislature, Representative Sargent was elected to two terms on the Dane County Board of Supervisors in 2010 and 2012, respectively. In addition to her work in the state legislature, Representative Sargent owns and manages OPA Color LLC, which is a small business dedicated to high quality art reproduction. A lifelong Madison resident, Representative Sargent lives with her husband and four sons on the north side. One of her sons attends the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and the other three attend public schools in the Madison Metropolitan, Metropolitan School District. I'm a little tongue-tied today, apparently. Um, Representative Sargent's public service in the state is certainly noteworthy, and her awards reflect this. In 2013, she won the Women in Government Award as State Director, the Citizen Action of Wisconsin Achievement Award, and the National Foundation of Women Legislatures, Women of Distinction Award. She is an exemplary role model, and it is an honor to have her here today to speak of the pink tax and what it means on a state level. Rep, a state level. Please welcome to the podium State Representative Melissa Sargent. to doing today. Good. So I do so much better when I'm giving talks like this where we can be interactive. So I'm hoping that if I say something um, or if you have a thought while I'm talking that you raise your hand or make some sort of gesture so that we can actually um, engage with one another throughout this conversation. Um, I am a state representative. Uh, I represent the 48th Assembly District, which we are in right now. Um, this great campus is really in the center of the 48th Assembly District, so you have a sense of the type of people that live, work, and play in the community that I represent. Um, it goes uh, from the east side of Madison by Buckeye Road and encompasses the airport and um, East Town Mall and this campus and war goes all the way over to Warner Park and um, includes uh, the governor's um, mansion in Maple Bluff as well. Um, I was born and raised here in the city of Madison and am proud to be raising my kids here in Madison as well. Never in a million years thought that I would be a state representative. Um, but about eight years ago, the lessons that my kids were being taught in school about how government works 
my memories of what I was taught in school about the way our government works and what was happening at the state and federal levels um, in our government were not fitting together. And I had, um, I had an epiphany. I felt like I had three choices that I could make. One of those choices would be watch a lot of reality TV and totally disconnect and stop caring. The other choice would be to be very angry and throw my arms up and I don't like being angry all the time. Um, and then the third option was listening to a voice that my dad um, planted in the back of my brain as a young girl. He used to say to me, Melissa, if you don't like what is happening, provide an alternative. Be the solution you desire. And it was a hard choice. That was a hard choice for me because quite frankly, um, I'm very introverted and um, becoming involved in the political process seemed very, very overwhelming to me. So that option of reality TV seemed like a lot of fun, quite frankly. However, I know that my kids and my community deserve so much more. And I, I just couldn't stop hearing the questions that people were asking right here in Wisconsin and frankly across our nation about why and how it is that we got into this position where what matters most to the people in our communities wasn't being heard and represented in our government. So I ran for office and it was an amazing, empowering, growing experience. And I'm telling you this, I know may feel a little bit disconnected because I'm here to talk about menstrual equality and the pink tax, but today is also an important day for our state and our nation because it is an election day. And I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for election days. And as we're talking today about menstrual equality and changing policy, whether it's menstrual policy or wage or racial disparities or funding for education, you all have a passion. The way we make those changes is by taking small incremental steps, and one of those small steps is voting. So I'm gonna plead to you right now, and I promise to leave you alone as I wear my billboard right here on my shirt. Please go and vote today. The polls are open until eight o'clock. There are a lot of fabulous places where you can go and do some research before you show up at your polling locations to find out what is on the ballot. Be um, knowledgeable. Don't just go in and um, color in the little bubbles because it feels good. Our democracy depends on each and every one of you. Um, and that is, quite frankly, how we move things forward. So the real business of our conversation today is to talk about menstrual equality. And I so appreciate the fact that there is a diverse group of folks in the audience. We have men and women. Um, we have young and old. And this really reminds me about the importance of this conversation um, and how it does touch everyone in our communities. About three years ago, I read an article about um, a country, and I can't remember what country was in the article, that provided menstrual products in their bathrooms. And I thought, wow, what a unique and amazing thing. You're actually providing menstrual products in the bathrooms for free to people that are using those bathrooms. So I'm used to, in our community, seeing dispensers in bathrooms. Not every bathroom, but some bathrooms have <coughs> menstrual dispensers. Most of them ask you to put a quarter in them. If I was to ask you all in this room who has a quarter on them today, would you even have a quarter? And oftentimes, if you would put that quarter in the dispenser, it would just pop out because there wasn't anything in it. And I, I actually took a picture of a bathroom um, that was in the city of Madison that had one of these menstrual dispensers and the quarter just fell through when I noticed that the door wobbled and I opened the door to see if oh maybe they just unlocked it and we're supposed to just reach in and, and get a, a sanitary pad and instead what I found was a pair of pants. I thought <laughs> well that's an interesting and unique way to solve this problem is just to stack pants in here. I think it was frankly a joke. 
Um, but it is no joke for those of you that do menstruate or have menstruated um, to be caught in a situation where you need a menstrual product and you do not have one. And frankly, um, those of us who do menstruate or have menstruated in our lives, we have all been caught in that situation. And this is something that um, even those of you that don't menstruate, for one reason or another, you should care very much about the fact that when you walk into a bathroom, all of your public health needs are addressed when you walk into that bathroom. You have your hand sanitizer, you have your soap, you have your paper towels, um, you have your toilet paper. And no one is asking how much it costs to be providing toilet paper or hand soap in the budgets for businesses, for nonprofits, for branches of government, for educational institutions. We're not having bake sales to be able to pay for our toilet paper or our soap. But for some reason, menstrual products are not in the bathrooms in the same way. And it is a huge public health issue. It's a huge equity issue. And as I started navigating this conversation in my head, from this one article that I read, I started, the fir my first response was um, a response that I think many people initially have, and that is, well, as women, we're supposed to just be responsible for ourselves. If I was a responsible woman, and I had my stuff together, I would just always have menstrual products in my purse. And that's just the way it should be. And then I started walking down this path in my brain and I, I started getting a little bit angry, quite frankly. Why is it that we as women are taught that we should be taking care of this? Because we're not carrying toilet paper around in our purses, and we're not expected to carry soap or hand sanitizer or paper towels. So why is it that this is treated differently in society? It's not okay. Um, and when I talked to people, um, I was, told so many stories, people of my, um, of my grandmother's generation, about how that's one of the reasons why they didn't work. Because they didn't want to have to deal with having their period and having menstrual products were very different when, when she was a young woman. Having to carry around, ultimately, a diaper in order to take care of herself and bring it home and clean it and how would you store that. Um, I was told stories from young people that are in high school in the city of Madison right now about how their families couldn't afford menstrual products. They cannot afford menstrual products. They're very expensive. And on the days when they would be menstruating, they just wouldn't go to school. Our kids are mandated to go to school, and they wouldn't go to school because we're not providing this basic hygiene product in our bathroom. I was told stories about executives who were at work, working many, many long hours, 12 hours maybe on a project, and all of a sudden they found that they needed a menstrual product. And their solution was to just wrap toilet paper up and put it in their pants. I'm not telling you these stories to gross you out or to upset you. This is the reality that is in our communities. Every woman has a story, every person who menstruates has a story that matches these stories that I'm telling you. They are not unique. So I started thinking as a policymaker, what could I do as a state representative to help correct this, to help change this conversation? And this is tough because not only is it menstruation considered taboo in our society, it's not something that we really talk about, um, you're walking from your office or your school classroom to a bathroom and you would stick your tampon or pad up your sleeve so people don't see it. Um, you don't really talk, well I just have to go to the bathroom. You don't talk about it, right? Um, <coughs> so how would I, as a policymaker, bring this conversation forward when there's so much taboo around it? In addition to the fact that as a Democrat, I am way deep in the minority in our state legislature. And you add on top of that, that so many issues that um, touch women um, 
women's health and women's rights in the state of Wisconsin have been rolled back over the last handful of years, whether it's equal pay, um, whether it's family leave, um, whether it's the ability to make our own health care decisions. There are many reasons why this is a challenging conversation to have in the Capitol building right now. But it's an important conversation, and I've never been afraid of a challenge. So I started rolling up my sleeves and working on what it is that my dream policy would be in the state of Wisconsin to address menstrual equality. And my dream legislation would be that in every building that provides um, menstrual product or provides um, toilet paper and hand sanitizer and um, hand towels and soap, so that receives state funding, that they would also provide menstrual products in those bathrooms. I can't tell private business what it is that they are gonna do in their bathrooms. So I started broad. So this would be our jails and our prisons, be our schools, it would be campuses like this, it would be our airports, it would be our zoos, um, our state parks, our courthouses. Imagine where it is that our tax dollars go. Any place that receives state tax dollars would then be providing menstrual products in their bathrooms in the same way that we are providing toilet paper, hand sanitizer, soap, and paper towels. So I drafted a piece of legislation, and I didn't draft that legislation thinking in this political climate I was going to get that passed. I drafted that legislation believing that I was going to be able to have a conversation with people across the state of Wisconsin and quite frankly, maybe local <coughs> levels of government, maybe um, small businesses, maybe large businesses, would decide that this is an idea that they should embrace in their little corner of the world and they could make a change. And someday, because we are having this conversation, the stigma and the taboo would start to be peeled back and we would actually be able to do this legislatively, whether we're talking about at the national level or at the state level. And um, I was pretty proud of the piece of legislation that my staff and I had put together. Um, and I was trying to figure out when it was that I was going to introduce this piece of legislation. And this is the one term that my, um, my talk today is going to go a little partisan. Um, I had a colleague in the legislature right at the same time introduce a piece of legislation um, that would have um, influenced where trans people can go to the bathroom. And he introduced that piece of legislation and said, as he was introducing it, that this was a safety issue, a public health issue. And I, it made me mad. That piece of legislation made me very mad. And again, I don't like to be mad. Remember, I explained that. I don't like to be mad. So I decided, you know, this is the perfect opportunity for me to introduce a real piece of legislation that will address public health and safety in bathrooms. So if people want to be talking about how it is that we address public health and safety in our bathrooms in the state of Wisconsin, I have a real solution on how we can address that. It doesn't have anything to do with where trans people go to the bathroom. So I wasn't quite ready to roll out my bill, but I decided now is the time to do it. And I put out a very broad piece of legislation that would mandate menstrual products in bathrooms across the state of Wisconsin. And I didn't expect a lot of splash from putting this piece of legislation out. Um, but it was, there was an amazing um, war that traveled not only across the state of Wisconsin, but there was an international um, attention that was drawn on, on this bill. And there were a number of different pieces of legislation that were being considered across our, our globe at this time when it comes to um, menstrual equality in different forms. And I'm not sure why it is that there was this wave that traveled across our, um, across our globe at that point in time, but I am proud to have been part of it. Um, I had people, men and women, young and old, um, reaching out to me and shaming me about the legislation that I had put out, very similarly to my initial um, concerns. <laughs> Well, if you're a real woman, you should just be able to know that this is something that's going to happen and you'll be better prepared. So clearly, you're not prepared. And maybe you shouldn't be in office if you're that not prepared. Um, I had people tell me that, frankly, I should be working on bigger, more important issues. Well, I can walk and chew gum at the same time. 
those of you that know anything about government know you don't just put out one bill and work on that one bill at, at a time. Um, but at the same time, I had young women and um, fathers and um, trans men reaching out to me and sharing their stories with me about why it is that this validated who they are and the importance of them in their communities and how they could be better workers and they could be better students and they could actually enjoy life and they could recreate in a more comfortable way if actually society recognized the fact that menstruation is the sign of a healthy person. People who menstruate, who are meant to menstruate, are healthy. And that provided me with hope that I was, and reminded me that I was doing the right thing. And through, um, through that path, I connected with folks in New York City and in Australia and in Canada who are also involved in discussing what menstrual quality actually is in our society and have made an amazing network of powerful people who really want to make worldwide change. I had the opportunity to meet with folks from Korea. There were a delegation from North and South Korea talking about the importance of menstrual quality in their country. Um, I had the opportunity to tour the first school in New York City that provided free menstrual products for their students and talk to the high school students about how it is they could actually stay in class. They could go to school in the morning and they could know that they were valued in their school in a way that they didn't feel valued before those menstrual products were provided. And I, I have, since introducing that bill, seen across, just in Wisconsin, campuses through the UW system, as well as within our um, um, K through 12 school system, as well as within many businesses that are not just piloting, but actually embracing menstrual quality. The Madison School District is now providing menstrual products in all of their middle schools and high schools because we did a pilot program at East High School for one year and were able to talk to the students and teachers, both male and female, about the difference that it made. And we were able to look at the costs associated with actually providing menstrual products, the installation of the dispensers and the products. And the benefits so outweighed any conversation of costs. The administrators looked at their budgets and said, we are not questioning how much toilet paper costs in the Madison School District. We are not asking parents to bring in a ream of toilet paper so that our children can learn. And I was so proud of the superintendent for expanding menstrual products through our middle schools and high schools. There are pilots here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison on their campus. The University of La Crosse has embraced menstrual products in all of their bathrooms where they provide toilet paper and paper towels. And I imagine that I'm gonna hear a story here about Madison College's campuses on how it is that the culture is gonna change here as well. Because we know that when people who menstruate are taken care of in their bathrooms, they feel that they're being taken care of where they spend most of their time. And our students and our faculty and all of our educational institutions deserve, deserve to know that they are respected and that their needs are being met. So shortly after I introduced the bill that would actually provide menstrual products and I've been able to watch this wave travel across um, our state and our nation and frankly across the globe <coughs> where menstrual products are provided. I had a, um, an intern in, in Europe for spring break just last week and she was texting me pictures of all of the bathrooms in Amsterdam <laughs> that had tampons and pads in them. Not even in dispensers, they were just in baskets and people were being respectful of that. Um, I also have been working very hard with my colleagues um, in the legislature to remove the tax on menstrual products in the state of Wisconsin. So this is a separate conversation. I don't want people to think that it's a choice of one or the other with these, with these bills. Um, in Wisconsin, bull semen is not taxed. Gun club memberships are not taxed. 
Um, Kit Kat candy bars are not taxed, but tampons and pads are. When you look up the purpose of a tax in our statutes, we are told that it is um, a way that we add a little revenue to the state for a luxury item. I have not been met one person in my life who menstruates who considers that a luxury. This um, is an important policy decision that I am hopeful that the state moves forward on in the right direction. It's actually bipartisanly supported. Um, and I am I'm believing very much that we are going to be able to make some changes on this and through the next legislative session. Because of the introduction of the removal of taxes on menstrual products in the state of Wisconsin, we've actually um, introduced another piece of legislation because so many people reached out to us diapers and um, absorbency products in the state of Wisconsin are also taxed. And I very much believe that that is not a luxury. It's not okay for um, either adults or children who need to wear absorbency products um, to be taxed on those either. That is not a luxury. That is a public health issue in the same way that menstrual products are public health issues. So um, at this point, the bill that would provide menstrual products in all of the bathrooms in the state of Wisconsin is supported only by Democrats. Though I know that this is a piece of policy that should be supported by folks regardless of their party affiliation. So I encourage you um, to reach out to your lawmakers um, and talk to people um, who may be business owners, um, be people that serve on boards of directors. Um, for nonprofits and other organizations in our communities and encourage them to be providing menstrual products um, in bathrooms. Carbon 4, um, they're over here, right? Carbon 4. Uh, they provide menstrual products in their bathroom. I like to have my listening sessions and office hours at Carbon 4 because they provide menstrual products in their bathrooms, right? There are businesses that, that do provide them. And I will always say, to the folks that are the owners of those businesses. I appreciate the fact that you do this. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I'm patronizing your business. And when I do, do a lot of business tours as a legislator um, for folks that own and work at businesses in the 48th Assembly District, and it's a question that I ask them. And many times, they're surprised. You know, they are a fabricator of a device. Um, and I am seeing their, their hard-working blue-collar folks on the factory floor putting this device together and here I am very interested and intrigued about what it is that they're doing but before I leave I take the opportunity to ask them about how it is that they're pro providing for menstrual equality um, for their employees um, and people that visit their business. So the way it is that we make change on um, <laughs> things that we're passionate about, whether it's menstrual equality, um, more funding for our schools, gun safety reform, um, legalizing marijuana, these are some of the things that I care very much about, is by being willing to have conversations with people about them. And not shaming them when they feel differently than we do, but listening intently to what it is that they are concerned about. Um, and frankly, when it comes to the menstrual equality movement, the concerns tend to go away after people start thinking about why is it that the policies are the way they are right now. Um, and a big reason is that when our first state laws were being written about what it is that is provided in bathrooms, we didn't have women at the table. We did not have women serving in our government. We did not have women that were elected representatives or that were appointed as cabinet members. Um, and frankly, there was not very many women that worked um, in government at that point in time. But that's changing. And this is a small but very important step that we can take as a society to make sure that 50% of the people in our communities are valued, know that they are valued when they walk into bathrooms. So like I said, I do really well when people engage. I would love to maybe take some questions at this point. I think there were some note cards that were on the table, so maybe folks had some of those. I did also bring with me since introducing this conversation, um, there's been a book that's been written called Periods Gone Public, Taking a Stand on Menstrual Equality. Fabulous woman named Jennifer Weiss Wolf wrote this book. Um, and I am super proud to be mentioned in it. Um, 
with a number of other um, policymakers from across the world. But if you're interested in knowing how this um, this movement has been um, has been taken, this is a, a good read for you. And you know you're talking about something that's important when Newsweek puts it on their cover. This was very shortly after um, I introduced the legislation, and I had Newsweek calling me and asking me for quotes, and I had Cosmopolitan asking me um, to make statements about why it is that this is so important. This is a cultural issue. There's a shift that is um, happening, and you all play a super important role in making sure that it, it is addressed appropriately. Thanks everyone for coming today for this event. And thanks to Representative Sargent for being here. For those who don't know me, my name is Tina Marshallek. I'm the Student Senate President. The Student Senate Pres excuse me, the Student Senate as well as Women Lead and Phi Theta Kappa all co-sponsored this event. I'm emceeing the co emceeing the event with the lovely Kat Larson, the president from Phi Theta Kappa. Uh, you all have pens and note cards on your tables. If you have questions for Representative Sargent, please t take advantage of that and write it down, then hold it up way up high so that Kat, who's in the back with the blue bucket, can come around, grab your cards, and we can ask the questions to the representative. Uh, we already drafted some quickly beforehand so that we had some to ask now, and since we have one microphone, you and I will tag team, and I'll read a question, then we can switch. So here are some of them that we have coming up. From your experience facing opposition on this issue, what is your advice to student leaders, particularly women, who confront this issue in terms of stigma and public policy? All right, that's a great question, and I'm gonna take a little break here before I answer it and let you know that um, I do have a Twitter account and a Facebook account, and if any of you wanna be tweeting um, or sharing, I know that that's something that some talks that I take part in like to um, like to engage in it's at rep sergeant for Twitter and the Facebook is just Melissa Sargent and the, actually the address is on the back of the, um, the brochure so opposition wise um, you know it's tough uh, some people will say things that are really um, hurtful we have a president that said bleeding out of her everywhere menstruation is taboo um, but we can own this conversation. It is also a sign of a healthy human being. And there is, there is no reason why we should let people off when they act like bullies or if they are not um, educated on this topic. I had one person who wanted to talk to me about why this is so important. They were so confused and very earnestly confused about why this is an important conversation, an important policy for us to address. He thought that you could just hold it, like you can hold urination until you get home and he needed to be taught and educated that that's not how it works you know it's more like a bloody nose it just happens right when he understood that his whole mind flipped and he very much supported this legislation again I think it's important that when we have conversations we don't judge people as um, good or bad we just talk to them and understand where it is that they're coming from, ask them questions, be curious, and then engage and try to address their concerns. Because if we come at them with our hackles up, we're not going to be able to really address true menstrual equality in our communities. And don't be afraid to talk about it. Just because it has been an uncomfortable thing, because there is taboo around it, um, doesn't mean that you shouldn't. Be brave. Every time that I have been brave, to talk about something that is tough. Doors have opened and great things have happened for me and for other people. It is hard. Share your stories, ladies. It is hard and if you're not comfortable saying this is my story, it's very easy to say, I met a person who shared the story with me and they gave me permission to share it with you today. This is why this is an important policy. This is an equity issue on so many levels. Next question we have, also, please do write the questions on the note cards and raise them up high so that Kat can come around and grab them. Because of lack of access to menstrual products increases risk of toxic shock syndrome and even death, should public institutions like colleges and universities also focus on promoting healthcare resources specifically targeted towards people who cannot afford menstrual products? 
So my simple answer to that question is universities and colleges, educational institutions of all levels should absolutely be providing menstrual products. Um, there is no reason why when I walk into a bathroom here on this campus, there are not menstrual products in it. They can afford it. It's not a matter of how much things cost. And yes, this is a public health issue. Um, and it's also a social justice issue. Um, we, as a society, just need to request that this happens. And when we request it, it's very hard for people to say, no, I'm not gonna do that. There's not, there's not a good answer. If someone says, well, you know, the budget's tight this year. All right, so are you gonna charge 10 cents for toilet paper in the bathrooms? No, you're not. All right, well, let's figure out how to address this budgetarily a different way. This, this, is, this is a policy that we can change just by engaging in the conversation. Thanks. Next question. Do we have an estimate on what the cost would be of providing these products in public places statewide? That's a very good question. It's my job to um, be prudent with our taxpayers' dollars that come into the state of Wisconsin. Even as a very progressive um, Democrat, I care about how it is that we spend our money in the state of Wisconsin. I will tell you, though, that when I received every bill that you draft and introduce for consideration has a fiscal estimate attached to it. And when I received the fiscal estimate attached to providing menstrual products in bathrooms, so there would be two different fiscal estimates, one for the tax and one for the bathroom um, providing products, the, um, the fiscal estimator assumed that all of the women in Wisconsin are currently menstruating when they made their estimate. So that would be newborn babies all the way up to 120 year old grandmas. Um, and that 100% of the menstrual products that they are using would be you provided in these public bathrooms. You wouldn't be buying your own menstrual products. So there is a number of false assumptions in the fiscal estimate that I received. Um, and it makes it very hard for us to know actually how much this is gonna cost. Now we do have great um, examples now that the school district, for example, the Madison Public Schools are providing menstrual products. We'll be able to take those numbers. How much are they spending? What a percentage of their population are people who menstruate? And actually have a better idea of how much it costs. Um, New York City has been providing menstrual products in their schools and in their um, jails and prisons and in their homeless shelters. Um, and we can ask them, how much are you spending? How many people are actually coming in? And um, Dane County, we've had some great leadership from Supervisor Heidi Wegleitner here, right here in Dane County, um, working very hard for menstrual equality um, at the county level, in our county facilities. And we can look at how much it's been costing Dane County, which is one of the most populous counties in the state, um, to provide menstrual products. And we can do some simple math and actually figure out the costs at that level. As far as the tax, um, it looks like it would be uh, about $3 million uh, of lost tax revenue a year. Um, and that seems like a lot of money. $3 million kind of takes my breath away when I think about that. But if you do the math and figure out what percentage of our state budget that is, there's a period and five zeros before you even see a number. So again, we, we, can, we can address this. If we can give $4.5 billion away to an out of, here I'm gonna be partisan again, I'm gonna warn you, an out of country bazillionaire who wants to put in a factory that's gonna create maybe 1,300 jobs in the state of Wisconsin, 13,000 jobs, we can afford to not tax menstrual products in the state of Wisconsin. How big of a role do you think sex education or lack thereof plays in the opposition you receive to menstrual product issues? So one of the very first policies um, that Governor Walker repealed uh, when he became the governor of the state of Wisconsin was um, repealing comprehensive sex ed in our state. That doesn't mean that local school districts can't still provide it if they want to, um, but it means that it's not something that we are providing to all the school children in our state. Now, our young people are way ahead when it comes to uh, menstrual equality. When I talk to them, 
um, boys aren't afraid of tampons in the same way that they were when I was young and in high school, which is great. That means we're doing you know, a reasonable job with our young men. Um, however, the biggest opposition um, that I've had with this has actually been older folks. So I very much support comprehensive sex ed, um, but I do think that one of the bigger <laughs> challenges that we have is generationally. Um, we have folks who believe very much that we should be taking care of ourselves, right? My, like my grandma's, that, I told that story about my grandma. You should just, you should just take care of yourself, Melissa. You know that it's gonna be something that you're gonna need. You should just have it. Well, you know, do you always have your purse? Um, and, and do you always have a pen? Do you always have a quarter? Uh, it, so a big part of it, um, I think, is, again, having conversations with people who may be unlikely folks to be having conversations with about why this is something that is important and how we can be addressing it. Um, at the same time, I very, 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 very much support comprehensive sex ed, and it will be something that I will fight very hard for until it happens, um, is reintroduced into our state. Do you have any thoughts on potentially having medical providers and crisis centers provide uh, or, or supply feminine hygiene products to help low-income families? Um, so, I, yes, I think that anywhere that we can be providing menstrual products is important. Um, one of the things that we know is that um, when menstrual products and other absorbency products like diapers um, are donated to pantries and shelters, they are some of the first things to go. Um, that is something that we should think about when people ask you to uh, make a donation to a food pantry or to a, um, um, a shelter of, of some sort, um, whether it's Briar Patch or Days. Uh, a lot of people will think about providing um, many, many things, toys, clothes, and they do not think about menstrual products. Menstrual products and other absorbency items are very important for us to continue um, to provide and maybe put higher on your list um, to be providing to pantries and, and, and other facilities that support folks um, that don't have the means to purchase their own. But that doesn't mean that we don't also talk about what it is that's going on in our public in our public bathrooms across the state of Wisconsin, which my policy does, or the importance of removing the tax on menstrual products. Um, I actually have a bathroom in the Capitol that I've adopted. Um, the bathroom on the third floor, west wing of the Capitol, for those of you that might want to come and visit it, has a little basket that has tampons and pads in it at all times. I've been purchasing tampons and pads on my own and um, filling that basket for a year and a half or so. And I'm not broke by doing it. Um, they're, people are very respectful of it. And um, they're used as they're needed. And these are things that we can also do um, until society makes these changes. It, it provides a little message to my colleagues that use that bathroom that have not signed on to my legislation. When they need one of those tampons and pads, guess which bathroom they're coming to and using. Right, but they're not willing to put their name on my bill quite yet. But it reminds them of the importance of it. So there are ways um, that we can support this movement um, and, and, and kind of broaden the conversation um, by, again, like I said, thanking businesses that are providing um, tampons and pads, but also um, encouraging ones that don't, or asking if maybe you can adopt to their bathroom and, and provide products there. For conservatives that are sympathetic to this issue, how would you suggest that they approach this issue when speaking with fellow conservatives? Again, when I talk about um, menstrual equality, I try very hard not to make this be a super partisan issue because it shouldn't be. Um, this should be something that we can all agree on regardless of our party affiliation. Um, I do realize that I've made a couple of comments about who I am and different policies that I support or don't support that are separate from menstrual, um, menstrual issues, right? So a big thing uh, with conservatives is um, taxation. So they would be very happy um, to remove taxes on a lot of items. So that's one way you can approach this conversation is to talk about the inequity of our tax system and why it is that we need to be making some changes there. Uh, I think that also that conservatives 
know and love women in the same way that Democrats know and love women. And they know and love women who have experienced in their lives the need for menstrual products, um, and they have not had them. And uh, this is absolutely an equity issue. It's not a partisan issue. So when you're talking to your friends, regardless of their party affiliation, um, encourage them to be open-minded about um, menstrual quality and why it is that this will actually make your workforce be stronger and your students feel more supported and able to be better learners. Thanks for your patience. I was getting that signal of wrap it up pretty soon. So this will be our last question and then we'll move on to our round table, which you are welcome to stay for and we understand you're a very busy person and you're not in any means necessarily expected to. There are many different types of products that have a range of price and quality, so how would legislation reflect a fair baseline? All right, so um, I, you, I walk into a Walgreens store and there is a whole entire aisle for menstrual products and it is so confusing even for me as I look at all of the choices. Um, this piece of, the, in particular, the piece of legislation that would be mandating um, menstrual products in bathrooms, it would be very much like toilet paper. There's only one type of toilet paper in your bathrooms here or at any, <laughs> any place that you go, the airport or the zoo. You don't get a choice, right? So it would be the same thing. Your local level of government, um, your educational institution, uh, would be able to make their decision on what products they were going to be purchasing and providing. They just need to purchase and provide those products for free for folks in the bathroom. If you have some personal preference and you don't want to be using the tampon or the pad that comes out of that machine um, or that is in that basket, no one's going to force you to use it, right? You can choose not to. It's just there if you need it. In the same way that if you really wanted to, you could walk around with a roll of toilet paper, extra fluffy Charmin, in the color pink with some fragrance on it if you wanted and you didn't want to use the toilet paper that's provided in the bathrooms, right? So there's, there's nothing that says it needs to be a specific product. Um, it's just that they need to be there. Okay, thanks again to everyone here who came for the informational session. Thank you very much, Representative Sargent, for being here with us and answering all of our questions. We are now going to move on to the roundtable event so that we can try to scrunch as many people together for the most productive discussion as possible. We're gonna ask that people try to come more towards the front tables if you find see a spot that's um, available for you to sit down. And I believe Wendy from IDPS is going to be facilitating. So we can, uh, as soon as people start moving up, we can start to bring people over there. A special thank you to all the co-sponsoring student organizations, including Phi Beta Kappa, Student Senate, and Women Lead. Also, I want to give special recognition to uh, two people who did just about all the operations work who were not really recognized, which includes Britton Downing, who's the Vice President of Service for Phi Beta Kappa, and Liv Arndt, who's the Vice President of Public Relations for the Student Senate. Also, another shout out to all the student leaders in particular who are in the audience, Editor-in-Chief of the Clarion. There's a whole table of student senate members as well as a Phi Theta Kappa member and I've seen some other PTK and a bunch of other volunteer center sorts of people around too. So thank you again all for coming and please try to move forward. <laughs>